Welcome to our conversation. <laughs> I'm Dean Spade. Um, I am calling into this from Duwamish Territory, Seattle, Washington in the US. Um, and yeah, I'm trans activist, been doing mutual aid work for about 20 years and part of movements to abolish prisons and police and borders um, and militaries. Um, yeah. Um, hi, uh, my name is Nat Raha. Um, I'm a poet and an activist based here in Edinburgh, and I've been involved in uh, some mutual aid solidarity projects in Edinburgh for the last three years. I've been living in Edinburgh just a bit longer than that, and um, three and a half years. And I've been involved in some projects in London prior to that. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's a good way to <laughs> describe myself. Um, I guess I'm interested in questions around uh, justice. I've pre predominantly done work within queer and trans activist communities and yeah and uh, there are lots of connections that, between that and the forms of social change and transformation that I care about and hopefully that will emerge in our conversation. Oh. Nat, will you start us off by talking a little bit about some of your recent mutual aid work, both the stuff related to COVID but also the prior trans mutual aid work that you've been involved in, just like how it worked and what was it and what were the aims and why? Um, yes, of course. Uh, there's a question there. So I'm going to um, qualify at the beginning that I'm talking in a personal capacity and I'm not speaking as a representative of the groups that I'm talking about, I guess, the groups I've been involved in um, or I've been a part of. And I'm not, a, I'm not here with a mandate to, to, to give a representative example of what those groups are uh, doing at the moment. Um, but I can talk about some of the work. Um, so yeah, so I, I, the two kind of organisations I've been involved in, so um, one has been Edinburgh Action for Trans Health, we're a local chapter of a national trans liberation organisation um, called Action for Trans Health. Uh, the Edinburgh chapter, we kind of started in, so in like January 2017, um, and it's specifically thinking about, we were specifically working on issues of trans health care and uh, I think as a like as a uh, import as a space where there was clearly like a lot of work that needed to be done, um, often because of frustrations of like personal and the experiences of our peers and our friends and our comrades and stuff in terms of like struggling to access trans healthcare or struggling to get the uh, healthcare that they needed, um, and there's specifically issues around like so in a kind of in a narrow sense that sometimes was about um, like accessing uh, the NHS National Health Service provisions um, and then a much broader question about like uh, other other aspects other things people might need other forms of healthcare, care um, both like for other like other intersecting issues around like disability mental health but also just on like a practical level about like how do we provide the means of gender affirmation to the people who need it um, especially for people who are say just kind of setting out just ex beginning to explore their gender or whatever um, and trying to have a bit of a dialogue between that I think between people who've been around in trans and queer community organizing and, and in leftist organizing um, for like a number of years and um, for people who may be coming into it or who've become more politically active through more recent movements um, yeah and I guess so that was Action for Trans Health specifically, so there was also a national organization that's kind of now mostly not very active, not really happening at the time that was a, like a democratic national structure, mostly based in Manchester and, the, and in and around the northwest of England. And we were like this kind of like radical outlier <laughs> up in Scotland. Um, a lot of my personal thinking um, around, around doing like some kind of radical trans healthcare organization was firstly from but also influenced a lot by your own writing, Dean, um, around frustration with a kind of liberal transgender politics in the UK that was mostly based on legal, mostly focusing around legal recognition and media coverage in terms of like trying to make the media less transphobic. And we really wanted something that also spoke to the forms of like redistribution and social change and like challenging like the entrenchment of economic inequalities that we've had in the UK in the last 10 years. Uh, within regimes of austerity and, and such and such forth. Um, such forth, God, I said that. <laughs> and yeah, and we really wanted something that was like, okay, so how do we meet people's needs? How do we, what do people need? Um, how do we 
work towards that and work from that basis. But we were also uh, like, a lot of my thinking has been influenced by, um, uh, you know, like studying the seventies and being really interested in like our radical history of mutual aid around queer and trans people of color, you know, stuff like the work that Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson were doing in New York in the early seventies. And so that's been like, that's been a really important influence for me in terms of like thinking about, okay, so how do we, how do we do that kind of work now? Like, be it like form, the forms of consciousness raising that are very active in that, in the, in the seventies consciousness raising as a seventies kind of term. And um, yeah, and how do we support each other? What can we do? So that's, so there's, it's been very practical in like tools for gender affirmation, um, which, you know, is like getting uh, binders, clothing, um, for people, we we there we, have, we had some really specific problems around trans healthcare provisions in Edinburgh, um, <laughs> where they didn't really exist for a short period of time, um, because of like certain staff going on leave, um, and like really particular stuff. Like so, there was a really specific example of like uh, getting laser hair removal if you're a trans feminine or a trans woman was really difficult um, here. So we were like, what can we do about this? Is there a way that we can intervene? And isn't it? that ended up in a, it, like, we were just like, we can buy a, a laser device uh, with the funds that we've been fundraising and, you know, pass that around the community. And it's, it's got, so, which is a very direct, like, okay, so here's the colossal anxiety and stress around the loops, you have, the, the kind of hoops you have to jump through in order to get those provisions from the health service and like, you know, and here's a device you can try out yourself if you have the right kind of hair color or whatever. So it's very practical, like, that, that kind of directions. Um, since the kind of like onset of the COVID crisis in the UK, which is uh, of the coronavirus crisis, which is kind of like, kind of like began in uh, really kind of ramped up in, in March. Um, some of us who are involved in that group um, set out to start up a more specific mutual aid group working around coronavirus support um, for queer and trans people in Edinburgh, um, which is called Mutual Aid Trans Edinburgh. Uh, you can look them up, the website is like mate.lgbt um, and there's a social media etc and um, mate, mates kind of turned into this like uh, it's, it's been building basically been building a community of support in various ways so we've been doing stuff that is specifically say around healthcare access like a website has been created about what trans healthcare looks like in the UK at the moment in terms of these like NHS GIC gender identity clinic provisions um, which is Trans Health UK, you can search it and you'll find it. Um, um, but also just like, a lot of it's been like resource sharing, uh, befriending people, make, trying to be isolation for people in, in this time, um, thinking about the specific forms of isolation that queer and trans people might be experiencing um, within the kind of the lockdown of, COVID, of the coronavirus crisis here. And, and then like the practical stuff, like, you know, doing errands for people, like distributing safety supplies, um, all of that stuff that's, that can make like a big difference. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me... <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> that's maybe a good point to, to pause. Uh, and and Jean, Dean, do you want to talk about some of the work you've been doing? That'd be, I could say more. Can I ask you a couple of follow-up questions just because that was so interesting to me? Yes. Um, <laughs> One thing I'm interested in, and it's okay if any of these are like not in, not something you want to dive into. I'm really interested in um, mutual aid groups that have that um, are like chapter based, and it sounded like um, the first one you were talking about is like that. And one of the questions I have is like, you know, were the chap are the chapters autonomous, or do they is there some kind of coordinated action? And also related to that, it feels like in trans health policy work or like trans health work that's about what the government is or isn't doing, which is a bigger deal in places where there is government healthcare, I think, because um, there's sometimes potentially a possibility to get stuff, although I realize it doesn't always happen. Um, I wonder if like you are interfacing a lot in this, in that work with like the more liberal trans orgs or like groups that don't work on a mutual aid model. Um, and kind of, it sounds like the, like the work you do straddles like both this like powerful thing where it's like we just provide for each other we're passing around this laser hair removal machine and realizing we can do it ourselves which is so beautiful and exciting and practical as you said and also the work that's sort of like okay it's not being provided here can we navigate that together or maybe apply pressure and so i'm just i'm curious both about that kind of like yeah 
I think we we also really hit that mix of like there were there were things we wanted to do that we didn't have the capacity to do in terms of like putting pressure on the people who were supposed to be providing services, um, and also being aware that most of the NGOs are mostly in dialogue with those people, so we kind of didn't need to be doing that. So um, Action for Trans Health specifically, um, yeah, was a chapter based organisation across the UK. I can't really speak for what other chapters were doing. Um, but there was a, a general, like, there was a centralized structure and like a democratic structure within that and a, a committee who were running a solidarity fund and the solidarity fund was doing like, um, you know, trans have, being like money for trans health in the broadest sense, specifically also focusing on trans people of color or having specific money for that's going to trans people of color and uh, trans people in prison. And that organization was also doing like uh, explicit, like abolitionist prisoner solidarity work um, particularly around the deaths of uh, a couple of trans women in in male prisons in the in England, um, and this is like two or three years ago. Um, because of the nature of that like radical liberation message, though, I think it it was quite quite alienating for um, uh, the kind of liberal NGO world. <laughs> it's like, oh, here are the radicals doing their thing. In that way, that it's really easy for them to other radicals. In in that sense, this is like three or three years ago. Um, so you know, it's just after Trump happened, just after Brexit, um, and or the Brexit vote. Um, and yeah, and I think it was really, it was really, uh, it's it's frustrating because it was like. Sure, on the one hand, like we don't agree with the whole structure of the NGO industrial complex. Um, and we know that's not providing for us. It's had plenty of opportunity to do that, but still failing on its own terms. Um, and uh, and also being like, oh yeah, we, uh, what do I want to say? I want to say that our message, the, we also were like, we don't need to be liked by these people. You know, we actually need a different political consciousness around what trans health is in the UK or what queer health and queer liberation looks like and that doesn't necessarily that's not compatible with those kind of like with the NGOs or with the necessarily without the government they're doing things um but then it's interesting now because then you know fast forward to spring summer 2020 in the in the period that we're in um you know where mutual aid has <laughs> become this like word that you hear from even the most the, in, the, in the mouths of the most conservative people um and actually mates, you know, mate has not got this like political, uh, explicit political front, which I think actually Trans Health did in terms of like the manifesto and the kind of ideas we were trying to put out into the ecosystem. Um, but it's, uh, but also because people, because I think some of these like more friendly, more kind of friendly, more um, popular public spaces are uh, int uh, really gunning to support like, LGBTQ mutual aid project, projects, like mate has quite a bit of traction with that. And that's really, really exciting and kind of useful because it is about like, how do we get the message of this, that the support is out there, that people are providing it. You know, even though the work is being done in a political way, I think that's that's an interesting balance. Yeah, I don't know if you have thoughts about that too. Well, one thing that I, we've seen a lot here, or I, this is my perception, um, is that in the context of the COVID crisis, we really see the inadequacy of the nonprofit framework as as potentially like meeting people's needs because like most nonprofits like just like closed <laughs> during it and sent their workers home and then like those like all the support that actually happened for people I don't just specifically mean LGBT people but just like in general seem to all come from like volunteer based groups and that I saw the same thing in terms of the current um, rebellion against policing that's happening like you just don't see like nonprofits are not players in it. Like, the, yep. like who's on the streets, who's in the autonomous zones or occupations that are forming, who's um, providing for each other all over the place, who's dealing with the direct supports people arrested for in protest, who's, who's supporting the families of people killed by the police. Like it just feels like, not, not exclusively, but just like the nonprofit forms relevancy feels really low um, in the context of like when social movements become more widespread or when crisis becomes more thorough. I'm curious if, you, if you're seeing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. Um, at least from what I've seen, it. Yeah, I feel like I'm also quite isolated in a certain a certain way around this stuff, and it's not really like it's definitely not visible. <laughs> um, especially when it's about trying to find other ways to do things and other ways to work. Like 
it's yeah it's fair if the nonprofits profits close their doors because they're trying to keep their workers safe in that way it's kind of what we we'd, we would expect given our understanding of what they actually do or don't do yeah there's like a kind of responsiveness i think that um a nimble responsiveness that grassroots volunteer based groups have that nonprofits don't have it's like it's really hard for them to change their tack when the crisis changes um, for a lot of reasons and so and people see it as their job so I think it's just different than like the kind of like instant responsive mutual aid work that I've seen around COVID in so many different ways um, during this period ranging from people setting up you know funds to support different kinds of workers who are out of work or setting up you know all the things you were talking about like grocery delivery prescription medicine delivery um, isolation breaking yeah, just the, 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 the nonprofits can't just transition to that kind of work because it's a really different um, shape. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that a lot. And they don't have the, like, they're, they're not set up to do that work in a way. And it's not what their funding is for. So if yeah. your funding is controlling what you can do, yeah, of course. And if your funding is controlling your imagination, like one of the things I've really felt strongly over the course of my life in queer and trans um, movements is that, uh, actually directly supporting people in crisis has not been valued by the liberal LGBT nonprofit establishment. Like they're all about like big lawsuits, media, um, legislation. They're, they, they don't actually have a part of their orgs that like support people who are like right now locked up in a psych facility and struggling or right now being arrested. There's not a number to call. Like, whereas mutual aid groups are all about that. And the, the mutual aid group I was part of for the longest, um, the Severe Vera Law Project is a nonprofit, but operating on it, um, you know, attempting to be in and not of that system. Um, I was part of that group from 2002 to 2019. And that group is like directly supporting low-income people who are in all these situations, public school, foster care, prisons and jails, immigration proceedings, et cetera. And also trying to lift up like, okay, what are the changes we might want to make in policy or some other interventions based on what those people are experiencing as opposed to, I think like the, um, the LGBT, the legal LGBT groups in the U S that are like the most famous and the largest and have the biggest funding. They don't interact with people who are in crisis. They come up with things, problems they want to solve based on like what a bunch of elite lawyers and mostly white people think are like an interesting legal tactic or something that would relate to their own biographies or something that, um, would be, a. a uh, like media friendly and make LGBT people look uh, legit. And so their agendas are really divorced from the vulnerability of, of yeah. like actual queer and trans people who are most vulnerable, like people with disabilities and poor people and people of color and um, et cetera. And that, that's, I think, an interesting element of like where mutual aid fits in the development of a politic is like, it tells us what's really wrong. It's like when we're doing mutual aid work, we know how the systems are really working in people's lives and like, what's really fucking people up. And if we, if there's no mutual, if, if, if the nonprofit sector mostly looks like no mutual aid work and just um, either like, like just divorced policy goals or like depoliticized social services that don't engage at all on a structural level, you get like this, you get a politics that doesn't like deliver the goods. And that's what most I think of LGBT like liberal politics has been in in our lifetimes from what, I, what I've experienced. Yeah, and I mean, this is, so this is a question about what the, you know, the mutuality of mutual aid um, that feels really present as well, being like, it's not a, it's not a voluntary, it's not a charity in a provision, like here are the providers, here are the, the service users. Um, and just, it, you know, in terms of like the forms of community building that we've been doing more recently with Mutual Aid Trans Edinburgh, um, which I'm, I think I maybe said already, it's like a, a trans and queer group. We decided to use trans as the primary word in the name of the organization um, because because we wanted to foreground the trans people involved in the organization. But like, there you know there are queer people who aren't who aren't trans involved too, uh, aren't trans yet. <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> but uh, yeah, and there's that, that question of like, oh, so you build communities that are. Act where like supporting each other and like actively um, providing for each other and thinking through what each other's needs might be becomes actually part of the consciousness of what community means. I think that's kind of like 
that's that feels like it's important and that's like a like on the one hand that's like an upskilling that's also uh, you know so i've been we've been talking about formal projects but um a lot of my more recent experience in mutual aid has been through kind of informal um you know individual support that we've been putting together for people in our in our kind of local neighborhood or in our friendship groups and um and that kind of like creates a, like an upskilling of like okay so how do we support each other in crisis like it's not like we're blind like actually i think by the time covid came around we were like i felt that amongst my kind of like amongst some of the people i'm working with amongst the people I'm, i've been organizing with over the past few years like we have the we already had the kind of skills that we needed we just needed some like concrete tech infrastructure to communicate with each other and that's the real that felt really like powerful and like oh it's not the, the there is a crisis but we do know how to start responding to a crisis like we already have the we know how to do the things that we might need it didn't it didn't like catch us um you know unawares which i think a lot of uh a lot of other people might have been there's there's a there, i was reading a piece earlier which says there's a piece in uh, galdem about um black centered mutual aid projects in the uk um in particular mutual aid uk sorry i'm doing lots of plugging at this point and they were talking about the like, oh, COVID is actually the first time where the people who used to be, you know, supposedly a privilege had to realize that they needed support because the state wasn't there to support them. And it's like, oh yeah, like actually because we're the kind of, because of our vulnerabilities, because the forms of uh, oppression we're facing and the experiences that come with that and the, uh, you know, the, ch the challenges that come with that, like we're kind of already, uh, we as like queer and trans people as people of color, we're already kind of like able to support each other because we know what we might need or we have we have the skills already to a degree. So it's not, it makes a ton of this less, less terrifying. Yeah. You said earlier, it's just on my mind too, like you mentioned like that part of what you all are doing is helping people break isolation. And when I looked at the website for Mate, I saw that, like that it was also like helping people find queer and trans community. And I, um, I think all the time about this thing that um, my friend Tourmaline, who I do some different collaborations with, had said to me like early in our lives, I mean, maybe a decade or something, she said something about how basically like isolation is actually the thing that endangers us all the most. And it's really, it really changed my life, right? Because it's like, it's so true. It's like when, when we when we don't have anyone to turn to like all of our mental health stuff is worse all of our like if we're in a, a domestic violence situation or some kind of dangerous relationship at work or at home or wherever like it's much much more likely somebody won't notice it or like also that i've seen in my lifetime that people's isolation that grows out of bad relationships is part of what is primarily endangering them and lets things escalate like isolation is like or like the center of it, or like just when we're in a situation where like something happens like on the street or on the bus or whatever and then uh we feel disconnected from one another we're much more unsafe than if we felt some level of like hey that person even if i don't know them is likely to help me i love that your cat keeps coming through um so isolation is just like this key key thing and i was thinking about that because what you're describing right now around having both kind of more formal mutual aid projects that really try to get the word out and have people be like, hey, I can call those people to help with my groceries or help talk about trans stuff um, versus the stuff that ideally we, ideally we would be, this stuff would be, these skills would be dissipating throughout society. So instead of always having to call an organization or call, like I think there's this, this thing happening with the defund police campaigns in the United States where a lot of people are like, well, we just have to be, have a different number we call when there's a crisis. Like, that's the goal, as opposed to, I think the goal would be not to have a number we call, which is kind of like this, I, it is based on the assumption that we're like very atomized and isolated and we don't have social circles and we're not connected to our neighbors and we're not connected to the other people on the bus. Um, and we have to go to an outside authority. Like that is the model that is policing. That is the like police state model. But instead what we're trying to move to is um, both having resources in the community, like, hey, those people are medics and they really know stuff, but also like, I know who in this apartment building is a medic, or I know um, on this block that if I hear something, I would go check it out. And, and this kind of like willingness and, and this also these pre-existing connections. Like I already helped that person the other day with their baby carriage or like carry the thing. So I'm, you know, or we already had a really long conversation the other day about whatever's happening on our block or in the city. And so we're ready to like support each other. Like that kind of, um, building that depth of communities of care and like awareness and interest like 
um, instead of this kind of like, I see something weird happening on the block and I'm like turning away and closing my shutters. Yeah. Um, I, I guess like I hear that it being described in what you're talking about with kind of like um, formal and informal work to support each other. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, you said it really, I think it's, it's that thing about like, this is what, that, that forms, these are the forms of isolation that like Capsa's life is bred for us, you know, and this is what white supremacy is about. It's about separating us from our people, from, from each other, from our people. And the, that, that's like, what at least has maybe been changing in terms of cultural change over the last few months here that like, you know, people have started talking to your, people have had to talk to their neighbors. <laughs> like it's actually really important. And that's, yeah, hopefully that can change and that can develop since we're there. Yeah. I'm wondering, wait, I don't know if you'd be willing to talk at all about like what this summer's rebellion against policing has looked like in your, uh, in your lo local world. Like what, like, I'm happy to share what it's like in Seattle, but like, I'm just curious, like what's, um, and, and if it relates for you to, to the mutual aid strategies you've been part of. Um, I can't really talk about what it what it looks like. I can mention some things that have happened, but I haven't directly participated in things. So I feel like my, at least like uh, IRL participation. Um, and I've been getting lots of updates and stuff that's been happening elsewhere in the UK. Um, and so in my local context in Edinburgh, we had, there was a, a Black Lives Matter demonstration that was organized at the start of June. Um, like 5,000 people turned up. It was a static demonstration in a major, in a big park here. Um, which was which was great as well, given the um, the forms of the kind of concerns about the kinds of restrictions of like the lockdown in terms of like gathering and people and the work concerns about concerns about policing. Um, so that that was really kind of it's it's really great to see things like that happening in a in a place that doesn't always feel like necessarily super radical, um, and also in a, in a town that has this kind of like sentiment that it's a very white place but in practice it's actually that like oh my god <laughs> sorry <laughs> this cat um and uh but in practice it's like there are actually quite a lot of people of color it's just like the way whiteness forms communities is the problem anyway um so that's that's one thing that's and then this has kind of t evolved quite quick quite rapidly into this into the uh questions around statues and around um uh, legacies of slavery and direct like the wealth that had built this town and where that wealth came from in terms of like yeah in terms of like uh, actual wealth made off enslavement and the money also made off the abolition of slavery in terms of the like UK government's recompense to slave owners um, uh, yes yeah, so that's they're kind of that's that's like what's been happening it's there's I know there's a lot more stuff happening in London a lot of other things happening in London and other parts of England um, and other parts of Scotland as well, uh, but yeah, I can't really. I feel like I, in terms, so in terms of like how that relates to mutual aid, uh, that's a good question. Let me have a think. Um, I ask you a different question about it before we go on. Yeah, I'm just curious. Like um, here, there's also this kind of like wild cultural moment happening, even though we've had other rebellions against against policing and against anti-black racism many times. There's this cultural moment happening where like they canceled the television show Cops and they are getting rid of. Uncle Ben's rice brand that's got this racist framing around the image. Like, yeah. I'm just curious, like, and people are, I mean, I, like everybody I know who works at like some elementary school or some middle school or some company, like all these places are having these like incredibly overdue conversations about anti-black racism, just like, you know, and so I'm just curious, is that also happening? Or, yeah, like, are you noticing? That is, that is definitely happening in the UK. Cause I think that's almost easy, like in some way, like it's, it's good that like, say particularly, specifically if we're talking about like companies, what companies are doing. Um, oh, there's just that brilliant meme about the like, which button do you press? Do you press the rainbow button or the, the black button for June in terms of like how companies are responding. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a sign that like, uh, I think on, so it's specific, I, I've definitely, definitely cottoned into you. On the one hand, it's like challenging anti-blackness and racism in current practice in terms of what people are doing in terms of like how it, forms of exclusion have taken place and that like reflective like whiteness finally having that reflective moment um on the other there is that there is this conversation about the legacy of the british empire which has been this like huge elephant in the room <laughs> you know that's like the elephant that built the room almost um that's finally starting to happen and that's there's been you know a lot of pushing about that and put it in the public sphere especially in like critical intellectual circles for a while but to see that go you know to go to have that go a bit more mainstream and be like hey like you know like those of us who were educated in the last couple of decades in this 
country didn't learn about these things in school still and uh that there are really important histories around that but it's how that also relates to what's what's still happening around like racist state violence is you know that's that's still really key in terms of like so in the uk it's like there's the hostile environment policy which was put together by Theresa may um uh before she was prime minister and then and it's like and this has been about the deporting of people from the windrush generation and uh like it's the general like make britain hell for migrants and that's like all of these things are still bubbling over and yeah it does feel like there's a consciousness about it like how that translates to cultural changes exciting um and but yeah we'll see we'll see we'll see where it goes you know will it will it be over because it's now july is <laughs> like in terms of the like corporate corporate responsibility oh, stuff yeah right. and is there a push to do is there the same kind of like conversations in a lot of cities to defund the police forces and i definitely think in in london there's definitely like a sense of like because the institutional violence of the Metropolitan Police and there is there's like specific cases like uh, in Scotland there was this quite high profile case of uh, Shaky Bai who was killed by the police um, like three or like four years ago and you know these are really specific campaigns of families looking for justice and so they've kind of like uh, reignited the public like or take, taken a, a much larger public platform they've been getting much um, much more um, uh, there's been a lot of awareness around that. I don't think, it, I feel like this sometimes doesn't feel like there's enough of a critical mass maybe outside of like London or outside of Birmingham uh, about defunding the police. It would be great if there was. Um, uh, yeah, I think that, but it's like in those, in those, in the bigger cities where the tensions are much higher and the, you know, in terms of like the amount of racist violence and anti-black violence from the police is, and how that's playing out on a day-to-day -day basis is, um, yeah, is much more prevalent almost to a degree. I think that's maybe the places where, the, where those, those things will emerge or are emerging. Uh, it's interesting to me to think about, I, I think in past trips to the UK, I've connected with people in Bent Bars, which is like, yeah. as I understand it, a, um, a project, a mutual aid project that has for many years now connected people inside UK prisons to uh, LGBT people inside UK prisons to um, uh, pen pals on the outside. And there's a lot of similar projects here in the US and also in Canada. Um, and it's interesting to me to kind of think about that role of mutual aid over the long period in developing abolition politics. Like the, the framework of mutual aid that people often use here in the US that comes out of the group critical resistance is like that we're trying to like directly support people who are inside or being criminalized right now. We're trying to stop them from growing more prisons, more jails, more criminal policies that put people that, you know, catch people up. Um, and we're trying to build like the world we want to live in in which we solve our problems not through caging people um and that piece around directly supporting people inside right now is like the the it really builds the politics because it's how we actually know what prisons are instead of what the government says prisons are and this the, you know things like in the u.s this has been really visible in, in queer and trans politics where the government passed a law many years ago now called the prison rape elimination act which is like that sounds good, let's eliminate um, the kinds of violence people experience in prison, but in actuality, it's been used almost entirely to criminalize queer and trans people in prison further and to, um, and to pass law, you know, additional regulations that say like, that you can't be gender nonconforming in this prison or else you're violating PREA. Um, it's just, you know, everything they add um, makes things worse, right, for prisoners. But we only know that because that we have because there's these deep, deep, deep connections. People inside prisons. If you just listen to what the government said, you'd think they've been like solving our problems, right? And so there's this piece around abolitionist praxis being so centered in mutual aid. You know, also not just people in prison, but also like court support projects or jail support projects or bail funds or um, projects to help people drive each other to visit their family members in prisons or prison education projects. Like so many different kinds of um, of mutual aid projects surrounding the harms that prisons and policing bring that actually I think have like built the politic and like built the like understandings of imprisonment and policing that um, then when these explosive moments of rebellion happen um, really ground a lot of that and also give us the understanding of the reforms we're not willing to accept and the kind of like um, we we've had these deep experiences of seeing the counter moves of the state 
when we when, when our pressure builds that we're unwilling to settle for and so I think it's really like it's really I can really feel it you know like, there's no way of knowing this rebellion would come right now mm-hmm. and for me like you know being in this movement for 20 years or whatever and then like you never know when the Ferguson moment or when the um you know the current rebellion will emerge but in some ways it's like you're we're all trying to constantly cr- make changes the whole time and also create the ground that um allows allows for the moment when a lot more people come into the analysis suddenly, when a lot more people find, like for me to see the word defund painted on all these streets all over the you know, country and be like, oh my God, I never thought I would live to see this to be a popular idea instead yeah. of just being like this really, really, you know, um, kind of fringe could, idea abolition. Could you talk a little bit about the, cause obviously like one of the things that I've seen from afar in terms of the, this, what's been happening in the States is the like prisoner release stuff that's been happening around COVID. Could you talk a little bit about that and maybe how that maybe ties up to the forms of support in relation to prisoner release? Yeah, I think this is probably one of the biggest abolition strategies before the current rebellion happened that, that was happening in the context of COVID was these different campaigns all over the country, mostly aimed, a lot of them were aimed at the state level at releasing, um, trying to get governors to, to use their clemency power um, to release people from prisons. Um, and because you know prisons are obviously always a public health crisis, but in the context of COVID, it, very extremely so. And there's also um, you know rebellions happening inside prisons to push this, like hunger strikes and other strategies by prisoners um, to try to get the word out about how, because of course the st- um, the states aren't um, testing people, so like it's like people th- there's like really inadequate um, data about how many people are infected with COVID inside, and then people also trying to share their stories about the ways in which they're not allowed to keep themselves safe and they're forced to be exposed to each other in ways that um, make it so dangerous. So there's been these really big pushes. I think there's been um, mixed results. I think definitely we would all say like inadequate releases, but there have been releases in some places. And it's, and it's also this danger of them releasing like people who have less stigmatized charges, which inevitably means it'll like, if you if they're trying to release people who they think are less dangerous, it's always gonna be like, more black people, more immigrant people, more people with disabilities are kept inside. You know, all those stigmatized charges also um, track to um, marginalized and targeted groups. So, um, so that's been, that is a dilemma. I think that work is really ongoing. At the same time, there's really interesting mutual aid strategies accompanying it. Like, um, you know, bail funds have just drastically grown in, in, um, in the U.S. during this period. And, and during this particular rebellion, there's been like the amount of people, money who, that has been donated to bail funds has skyrocketed. So people are much more able to get people out who have higher charges than we used to because they have the bails are higher. At the same time, there's a lot of interesting dilemmas about bail funds in the U.S. Um, and conversations because Um, We want bail funds to immediately get people out, but we also don't want the state to start to use bail phones as a complement to the criminal system. So um, like for the state to rely on bail funds as to almost incorporate them as part of the system that makes it more fair. Um, And so that we become kind of like, um, uh, like adjunct to the criminal system itself. Like, I mean, bail is ransom. We want to get rid of this entire system and stop people from being put in cages. So um, so yeah, I think that the, the the free them all campaign and the strategy to try to get people released is is has not. Um, I think some people I talk to are like I'm are shocked at how little success it's had because of how COVID inside prisons is you know a death sentence for so many people. It's outrageous that it hasn't worked more, and there have been some releases. And I think that's an interesting thing in the trajectory of prison abolition work. Um, the visibility of this campaign and the and the energy and force behind it is definitely like incredible um, and uh, insufficient results. I would say, Are, is something similar happening there around trying to free people from prisons and detention centers and nursing homes and other? Uh, it's, there's there's been a real mix of things because um, it's on the one hand it's like. Uh, there has there have been there was a, quite a widespread public campaign about yeah about working in prison and release trying to um focus on like how like how covid is like how prisons are gonna how covid is gonna turn into a hotbed in prisons um there's also there's also been a lot of stuff around immigration like asylum seeker housing that's some, so this is something that's been happening specifically in glasgow um 
and there's a, a, a place called the Unity Center, I don't know if you know their work in Glasgow. Um, they've been doing quite a bit of uh, work around um, how asylum seekers have been rehoused during the COVID crisis, which has led to, uh, um, they've been rehoused into hotels and then like had their uh, state fund, there's kind of pittance that the state gives them every week cut as a result of that. And this has led to like uh, a couple of high profile deaths um, and like like all of which is bound like the like a drastic effect of mental health, like on mental health for being rehoused in the, in in hotels during a crisis and all of the like se the severing of support for, in those certain ways. Um, so yeah, that's that's there's a lot of work in Glasgow specifically around that at the moment, and um, that feels like one of the things that's live and that's really yeah concerning. There's this question for me always like how much pressure does it take to win how much disruption to the s systems as they are? So it's like, include, so the, the pressure of our movements, obviously, and there's also the pressure of conditions of crisis, like the pressure of, on the government of um, COVID destruction of the capitalist economy resulted in the US in like these stimulus checks being sent to a lot of people, although not people who are undocumented and who have different kinds of, um, are not visible to the government as workers in the right way, you know, where people got this $1,200 check once. <laughs> it's like totally deeply inadequate, but, I, but it's also really unusual for the US government to give everybody money, right? Like it's like, they'll do anything to avoid that um, or to increase, to make unemployment benefits more, um, you know, more generous or easier to get or like, so I'm, I'm just really curious always about like, like what would it take for them to release people or what, you know, in the same way that we're often on a local level doing like, what would it take for them to not build this new jail or prison that we're fighting or to not, you know, it's like what amount of pressure, but it's interesting that we're thinking both about social movement pressure. Like, is there enough social movement pressure to, to defund the police in a particular um, city that's trying to do that or to, or to defund it how much to get rid of $1 million or to, to get rid of, you know, $5 million or what percent. And then also this question of the economic systems pressure uh, the economic crisis pressure um, under COVID, which I think is about to ramp back up. I mean, lots of people have been out of work this entire time, and it's obviously as COVID worsens again. Um, at what point will the U.S. government give people more economic relief, or will it just be like literally just gr grinding crisis with no support? I think these, um, yeah, it's just a real moment to kind of yeah, it's also almost like barometers of how uh, of how of how severe the crisis is and how much our left movements have been able to lift up solutions um, that have that feel like there's enough of a threat to push them through. And I feel like it's there's so much unknown right now. And when we look at like climate crisis stuff, which is obviously the other like you know giant crisis, it's like wow, there's it feels like there's almost <laughs> no. Um, there's almost no traction. Like it's just, it's, I'm, I'm just astonished by how, uh, by the deep, deep interaction of, of certainly the government where I live. And, and I think also like I see this in, in Canada and um, you know, recently there, we just had a, a win where a pipeline was canceled that was supposed to go through the Appalachian area, but it really just because like of activist pressure, it's not because like there was an awareness that we should stop fracking and oh, right. uh, yeah. yeah. I'm curious about what that looks like there, how you- I would, I would, I would to go back a tiny bit, because maybe we're, um, there was, there's a question about, um, oh, not a question, there's a thing about, um, uh, so on the one hand is there's, there's like the US government stimulus check, and on the other is like the bail funds in terms of these massive redistributions of wealth. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that, because that feels like, that's like one of the strategies that um, mutual aid plus BLM, like Black Lives Matter, um, you know, not that these things are separable, um, has been, there's one of the strategies that's been really prevalent and really kind of successful in terms of this like massive amounts of fundraising or significant amounts of fundraising to communities who don't necessarily have much money. And that feels like that. And also in terms of this, like t tapping into the liberal, like sort of like liberal consciousness of char liberal charity consciousness of like people being like, oh, I'm just going to give up my money at least I can do that. Um, and maybe we could talk a little bit about that in terms of like as a mutual aid strategy and redistribution, because I, I feel that obviously redistribution is really key and it is really enabling and like in terms of the projects I've been involved in, like directly like 
people fundraising for our organizations um even you know and it's it's always it always varies because it's like if you're fundraising within our communities or in like the adjacent communities that are adjacent that we have mutual relationships with like often those bits of money can be quite small um because you know it's not like we're moneyed um <laughs> but on the other hand this like you know but we'd always we always talk about like the funny so with and for edinburgh actually for trans health the funny question about pride about the corporatization of pride like the funny outcome is that at least it's really good for getting the pink pound out of the attendee out of the people you know and you can go around shaking your bucket on a sunny pride saturday and, and raise hundreds and hundreds of pounds in a way that like we couldn't do this on any other day of the year right it just wouldn't happen um and that feels like, and again, so that is about like, how do we, how do we get the resources we need to do the things that we might need to be able to do to support each other? And that feels really, um, that's quite exciting in a way. It's exciting to see those, that massive redistribution of wealth. And um, I guess specifically amongst black activists, like think about it in relation to, um, as like a form of reparations or the beginning of some kind of reparative or part of a reparative process that has to be continuing in the, in, you know, for a long time. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, on I think I think that you know, it's like on the one hand, the, the the kinds of money we raise through mutual aid projects and share with each other is it can be life changing, right? It can make the difference to have someone give some help somebody with their rent or help somebody with um, a healthcare need or a transportation need that literally otherwise they would have ended up in jail or prison because they would have not had it and then had to get it some other way or be criminalized for whatever. But on the other hand, it's like the amounts that we're raising and sharing with each other don't change most of the structural, like certain people live, like you could, you could be help, get helped by a bail fund, but you're still going back to living in like extremely, you know, a dangerous uh, housing that's inadequate and, and that you're living next to a factory and you have asthma and the police are harassing you. you know, like it's like, the, yeah. you know, you don't have an immigration status still, you know, like. It's, it's not like going to involve environmental degradation, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just, it's just like, you know, we're in some ways, um, the, 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 the redistribution we can do is, is, is limited. And it's, I think one of the questions, like I said, what, since the idea of mutual aid has been like mainstreaming during COVID and there's like a million articles about it and stuff, people who've never thought about it before. One of the things I hate to see in these articles is this assumption that the goal of mutual aid projects is to, is to get the government to do it instead, right? So that the goal is, or, you know, or to like collaborate with the government to do it really well. Whereas, of course, for me as an anarchist, the goal of mutual aid is actually to produce the world we want to live in that is that distributes things fairly. So if you look at things like the stimulus package or the um, the loans the government is giving to businesses here in the U.S., just like all aid, of course, it always leaves out the most vulnerable, the most stigmatized people. It actually puts more money in the hands of really rich people. Like that's just how all government aid programs are. Like they are just they're designed to be inadequate. They're designed to force you back to work as soon as possible. And they're designed to enrich white people and all people who are you know, men, et cetera. So there's this kind of like, um, it's like, how do we talk about the fact that the government aid programs that usually only come because of political pressure and that might copy or have some similar things of our mutual aid programs, the government aid programs, of course, reach more people because it's the government, it's bigger at scale, but it's, but at what cost, right? In terms of like, what kinds of extraction had to happen for that to be, who could do that? Mm -hmm. And our mutual aid programs are more local. They're wiser to the local conditions. They, get, they, they, they place the money more accurately around vulnerability because we're doing this thoughtfully in a small scale. Um, and they, um, ideally they actually like prioritize the right people instead of like putting all the money in the hands of like corporate pockets or only giving it to people who have the most like stable kinds of jobs or whatever. Um, and, and, and so I, I think part of what I've been trying to talk to people about is like, when we want, when we think about scaling up mutual aid, it's not about becoming like the government and having like one giant centralized thing. It's actually about having like so many jillions of tiny projects and, and, and small and medium sized projects that can use these deep local knowledges and be like appropriate kind of culturally and language wise and all the things to the actual communities that they're existing in so that we're building our capacity to survive um, not just to get the government to do it for us instead. So sometimes those concessions are great. They're great barometers of our success and our pressure. They're great. They, some, you know, that $1,200 stimulus check, I really hope helped a few people survive for a little longer, but it's not, um, yeah. So I think this, this, this tension about like our, and it's the same thing. I love what you're saying about the pink pound on, on pride Saturday. And like, 
it's like, we're, we're glad to get those, that money in the bucket, but we don't think this is a winning strategy because we're yeah. like, it's, it's, it's that, that mode of like that, I'll help you out because it's this one day a year and I feel generous. Like this is not redistribution as a politic. It's a, um, it's like a, it's a, it's a wide survival strategy for us right now to like pull, pull on those, you know, but in the same way, we don't want bail funds to be like to around forever. We want to get rid of jail. And so there's no, no need to have bail funds, right? Yeah, yeah yeah we don't just want to trickle down and i mean it's it's interesting here so there has been this attempt by sorry i'm getting some strobing um it's attempt there has been attempts by like local so like 10 years of austerity is like 10 years of defunding the local councils right or part of that's part of what's been defunded along with everything else um and they're they are like in they've been like the first people to try and co-opt the mutual local mutual aid groups <laughs> because that's like they're like oh shit people are doing our jobs for us so we should probably get in on that or try and get some control over it at least um and how do they try to co-opt it what, what does that look like like literally taking over groups you know in terms of like taking over their administration and the organization of groups um uh and but it's this it's in it's, i think it's that decentralized vision of yeah like many many groups many things locally like or through networks and like facilitating or developing the infrastructures for us to be linking each other up and to be holding, like to be uplifting other projects that exist as, and that have been existing for a while. Yeah, I feel like that's, um, sorry, my strobe is completely getting me. Um, that, that feels like it's something that's quite, at least like, if, if this has been, if part of, if on the one hand, there's been things responding to the crisis and on the other hand, it's been, there are already things in place or activists in place or people in place working together that has been like kind of ramped up or it's uh, things have, things have had to, things have emerged because of a crisis. Um, it does, it does feel like it's like the possibilities of like, okay, this is maybe actually the kinds of decentralized visions of the world that we need in terms of like, and that, that allies with like, uh like refusing disposability in an abolitionist sense and like refusing disposability around uh the walls of prisons in terms of inside and outside communities and yeah that does feel kind of like that that's that's what fills me with hope at these moments that maybe things will be like having lived through a moment like this maybe things will happen differently but then on the other hand there is a there a lot there so i think a lot of the so in terms of the people I've been working with, the people I've been learning from, like name checks and people we should name, like you know, we mentioned Tom Lee, and I'm thinking of other uh, like uh, queer disability justice activists. Like there's been a, this whole, um, the whole like of past 10 years in terms of like austerity and the um, like transformation of the, 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 the di dismantling and destruction of the welfare state has also been directly about trying to like weaponize it against service users and it turns into like that's been like really harmful and really violent and in terms of like it's you know in the run-up to the election at the end of last year it was saying like 120,000 people died as a result of austerity of disability cuts like it's, again it's like the same question about disposability in the eyes of the state and who is disposable and now we've just had like this you know and COVID's been so in that sense you're like oh you could have you could have seen this coming right the state doesn't care um but the only way that we kind of caring about each other and building things together and in, in like within our communities within our, our subcultures is like the way to to try and challenge that disposability yeah I, I really agree and um one thing that I think gives me hope in this too is like this kind of like the combination of like the deep caring sweetness of mutual aid and the kind of like ordinary day-to-day -day, like i'm just bringing you your groceries like there's nothing glamorous about this or i'm just writing you a letter or i'm just you know like this kind of um all the work that's been considered like women's work historically that is this yeah. care work that's just like i'm like and that and having that seeing that as revolutionary work and also having it tied to more bold strategies like i was or tactics i was I was just last night reading again about the Young Lords uh, party and when they like, um, you know, their first offensive was the garbage offensive where they like, yeah. you know, were drawing attention to the fact that garbage wasn't picked up and which is so like ordinary and mundane. And then I was reading about, you know, they did all the, you know, they, they provided a lot of um, healthcare and food and um, other kinds of basic mutual aid stuff in their communities. But they also were really, um, like one of their offensives was about tuberculosis and how the tuberculosis x-ray truck that people needed to uh, that was like a mobile unit that new york city had it wouldn't come 
um, during the hours that working people could actually get their chest x-ray and tuberculosis is a huge problem in Puerto Rican communities. And so they hijacked the truck and like brought it to the community and like um, the technicians decided to stay on and eventually they won, like the New York City paid for it to come at those hours then. So it's just this kind of like these bold tactics mixed with these caring tactics. And recently, um, probably the most like inspiring thing for me during COVID about that was hearing about how in Hong Kong, they've been having this like incredibly huge protest movement. All these people have been radicalized and been mobilized. There's been tons of mutual aid and care and support in it. So when COVID emerged, and their government was like doing nothing. They like made up masks illegal. They like, you know, were just totally not responding. They wouldn't close the border with, um, with China where there's like, there was like a direct high speed chain, train from Wuhan. So people were like, this is, you know, this should, we need to stop this. Um, and instead the protest movement like put hand sanitizing stations like all throughout the tenement apartments and kept them filled and created like all of these apps where you could find out where you could get hand sanitizer and they made masks really normal and everybody had masks and they distributed masks to old people and vulnerable people and um and basically like and then they also were doing bolder tactics like they some people somebody planted like explosives at the border and were like basically like you better fucking close this this border and you know like so there was like both you know direct fighting the police and the government in the streets and also making sure everybody has hand sanitizer and like making sure that the little dispensers are filled yeah. like this kind of loving care and radical moves and hong kong had like way 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 less cases because and that was like people so it's like that's mutually aid to scale like people did it themselves when the government failed and actually prevented um the the waves that we saw in other countries of the pandemic and so i just like to me that's like the biggest like that like love that lets me imagine bigger like what mutual aid can do and how it could be tied to like a deeper form of, of winning. And maybe this is because this is, this is a question about like, okay, to get a bit bleak for a minute, like sure COVID is happening now and there's, you know, we're all like it, we, England's already playing the second wave game and we're like, oh, it's going to be a matter of time. But like, we're going to have other extreme forms of crisis to face in the next 20, 30 years and it's going to be bleak. Um, and these are the strategies we're going to need in the future as well, in the immediate future. <laughs> and I don't just mean next week. I mean, like, you know, in the next years or that come. Um, but also, it's really important to think about the, the links between those two things, between the hand sanitizer and the, board, you know, arms of the um, I wanted to say there's one, one group that's been really central in all of this, and, which is Queer Care in the UK. They're in, like a network who've been, um, they've been active for a couple of years. But, and uh, I guess like specifically have, they've like tied like specifically working with a trans feminist ethos supporting people who experience trans misogyny. Um, and then also like doing work like uh, being street medics at demonstrations, you know, in terms of the kind of public demonstrations in London that are happening against the government, um, but also just like providing the safety, the kind of like the forms of the forms of hygiene and personal safety that you've been talking about in terms of like okay so how do we get the hand sanitizer and the masks out to people um and that feels like and they're trying to do they've been like coordinating coordinating that nationally which takes a lot of work and there's a lot of like uh it's not even the fifth because i guess this is the funny thing about mutual aid which is like everyone wants to be the person who delivers the groceries okay you don't want to maybe get you know because that's and that turns into or even just like there's some mutual aid i was doing at the start of the crisis that wasn't to do with the crisis um, where I was cleaning my friend's bathroom because she was recovering from surgery and cleaning her cat litter tray. And it turned into very quickly like, oh, this is the only moment of social contact that I'm going to have during the lockdown, which was really rewarding for me, even though I'm doing, you know, uh, doing, doing not the most glamorous work. But it also turned into, um, what do I want to say? Oh, I lost my thought. I was going to say something about the, like, the infrastructural work behind organizing mutual aid groups uh, is really, can be really tedious, can be really long-winded, can be really boring, can involve really long meetings. Um, but that's also really important in terms of, so yeah, Queer Care have been doing this incredible national coordination. They put together loads of protocols that have become the kind of standard, like um, at least like the most visible protocols around COVID and high COVID hygiene and like, uh, and also in terms of like how to take precaution when doing mutual aid. Um, in terms of what people have been sharing amongst other activist groups in the UK, which is really, yeah, really exciting. Because it's that thing of like, as queer and trans people, like we've been through a lot, we have a lot of experience, like actually like these forms of knowledge and these forms of resources are quite, can be quite readily available to us if we have the time to put them together and put them into the world. Um, yeah, so that's, 
that's which is I don't know maybe it's that thing about care and why like care and challenging isolation feels quite important and also how to cope with isolation I think that's like you know we've all had periods of like intensive isolation in our lives as queer and trans people I think that's like that, that can come with the territory and the degree <laughs> come with the experience and yeah figuring out how to how to um share those strategies for managing and coping feels really important yeah yeah, people really need to feel belonging to be well, you know. And, did you want to talk about, you were saying about harm reduction. Should we talk, did you want to talk a little bit about harm reduction in this sense? Oh, yeah, I just, I just noticed that that was part of what was on the, um, uh, one of the websites I looked at, uh, you know, of your work that was just, I was just made me think about um, how central the idea of immediately reducing harms and helping people find safety with self-determination like I think of harm reduction as, as safety with self-determination instead of the government telling me to just stop doing drugs or stop having sex or to stop, you know? Um, and so I just was thinking about that as a mutual aid value and my, what's a lot of the um, mutual aid projects I first learned from when I was um, entering the movement in the late mid nineties was like needle exchanges and um, you know, a lot of stuff around um, HIV prevention and around uh, dealing with the, with, drug use, not using the drug war framework. Um, and so I just was, I was excited to see it in the named explicitly in the context of your trans mutual aid work. I'd love to hear. Yeah. More. And it's, it's very explicitly around hormones and, and hormone therapy in relation to like knowing that that's, that's the thing that can make, if, if that's what people need or people want to, to like desire for themselves, like that can make such a massive difference in terms of like, physical mental health and body being but that's also like the thing that gets get gate kept the hardest and um the you know the the waiting list to access the stuff it, it can be like you know in, in some parts of the uk there are over 30 months and it's or <laughs> even longer in some places and that's like this it's a harm, it's a harm reduction is like okay so maybe actually self take, take self medding is maybe what you need and um, and Rational Trans Health came out with this, like we are all self-medding in terms of like not having enough enough actual um, like uh, institutional healthcare support to really be able to um, say that the institution has our back, you know, that actually is already in our hands and we just, we really need to share knowledge and support and information about like how to be using medications safely in terms of like looking out for side effects looking out for um, other potential things that can happen that can be bad. Um, but also being like, you don't have to wait, like don't wait and be depressed for years waiting on an appointment that might not deliver what you need. And actually taking you, taking your health into our own hands is like, what is the vision that we have in terms of like what trans healthcare ought to look like or could look like in a way that really does work for us rather than working against us <laughs> and trying to control and police and pathologize uh, trans bodies and trans lives. So true. Maybe we should wrap it up on that note. Um, yeah. Maybe. Any, any final thoughts? Um, uh, I, I feel like uh, we should, we'll probably, we'll make sure that there's lots of useful resources shared in terms of like um, mutual aid projects that are active. I feel like a lot of things have been, uh, in, in especially in the UK context, I feel like there's lots of things that have been um, been out there, and the word's been out there, and we've mentioned a bunch of groups uh, during the course of this conversation, so it'd be cool to link people up to those.